Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 8, Non-Infectious Disease and Disorders. This is video number 18, and we're going to be looking at genetic engineering and disease prevention. Now, this one follows on from the previous one that we looked at in terms of educational programs and public health campaigns. This time, we want to look at how we are using genetic engineering techniques to help us with some of these important diagnostic, treatment, and prevention methods. Uh, specifically relating to non-infectious disease. We want you to make sure that you can identify some of these genetic engineering techniques. And this shouldn't be too difficult, especially if you've had a look at module six by now, because there's a lot of techniques that are mentioned in module six that overlap here with this section of work. And so that means that we're able to blend these two things together, get a bit of a two for one offer happening here. As we learn this information, we can apply it in a couple of different places. So we want to make sure that we can not just understand some of these processes, but assess them in some way that allows us to talk about disease treatment or disease prevention, um, and specifically in relation to some named non-infectious diseases. So to recap then, genetic engineering is the use of genetic techniques that include DNA sequencing, recombinant DNA, and genetic editing. Uh, techniques like CRISPR to make some change in the genome, some change in the genetic sequence. So that could just be the sequence of bases within a particular gene. It could involve multiple genes. There's no specificity in this, and there are a lot of different applications of genetic engineering. But specifically what we want to know is, are there ways that we can either diagnose and treat or perhaps even prevent certain types of non-infectious diseases. Now, the fact that we've been able to map the human genome means we now have an idea of where a lot of very important um, sequences are, specifically those that relate to certain types of genetically inherited diseases or disorders. So that means there's a number of techniques that we can use in order to uh, try and screen embryos uh, before they uh, develop into uh, newborns to um, create some transgenic crops. And also we'll look at specifically um, hormone and vaccine production. Again, we'll revisit some of these things because we have talked to them, talked about them a little bit in the past, but just to see how they fit into this, the structure of this particular section of work. So obviously genetic screening can happen uh, either in utero or in vitro. The specific uh, way that that happens is that we need to be able to remove uh, cell, a particular cell from the growing embryo. So either that has to be done in utero, which is a little more difficult, uh, or if the uh, process of in vitro uh, fertilization is occurring, it can involve this pre-implantation genetic screening. Now that um, sounds like what it is. It means we screen these embryos. So we've we fertilize the egg externally. We've been able to take this egg and the sperm, inject the sperm into the egg, uh, allow that uh, cell to start to develop and divide. And as it forms a number of different cells, an embryo, we get, um, we extract one of those cells that we can then use. Now, what will happen is that we will test that cell. That cell will then either come up negative or positive for the particular disease that we're interested in. Um, if there's, usually this doesn't happen for a single cell, it will happen for multiple cells. So what may happen is you might find that some of them are positive for a particular um, genetic disorder and some of them are negative. And so the positive ones may be discarded uh, or maybe kept for other research purposes. And the um, ones that are negative will either be uh, implanted or they might be frozen for use at a later time. Well, obviously, there are some ethical consequences of these sorts of practices and the things that we do need to keep in mind um, with a lot of the genetic engineering that's applied to medicine, human medicine in particular. The process of um, pre-implantation genetic screening is not one I think you would really have to know a lot of detail about, but basically what we do is we use a technique called array comparative genomic hybridization, which uh, is simplified into the acronym A. CGH. And basically what we do is we take DNA from our patient, DNA from a control cell, and we basically mark them. We, we amplify them and we mark them. And so they're marked with these different colors. And so then we produce an array. An array is just a, a, a large number. 
uh, of these different pieces of DNA, and we can map the entire genome doing this from chromosome 1 to chromosome 20, 22, plus the X and, and or Ys. Um, and what you'll find is that in this particular technique, um, if they're coloured in two different colours, if there's equivalent amounts of each, then they'll come out some intermediate colour, which uh, from the slide you can see is yellow. If there's more of the patient uh, DNA for a particular sequence, then you find that that would be green. And if there's less of the patient one, um, then there's more of the control one, and then that would be red. So you would see these coming up as red, green, yellow dots, which we can then match up. So we're looking for the specific region, maybe where we know a particular genetic disease uh, appears, and we can have a look and see whether it's equivalent to our um, control cell that, that may be uh, positive or negative, and we can see whether or not um, the um, patient cell or the, the, the embryonic cell uh, is identical or not in that particular region. We've also talked about uh, golden rice. Golden rice is a really nice example of the use of genetic engineering for specifically targeting nutritional diseases. So we know that there's certain cultures where the balance of the diet is uh, not sufficient to ensure uh, a full range of vitamins, minerals, and, and key nutrients uh, are uh, absorbed, are, are taken in the diet. And so therefore, where we find that there can be some um, nutritional deficiencies, there may be ways that we can use genetic engineering in order to try and um, uh, reverse these effects or at least address some of these deficiencies. And golden rice is one example. It's got additional, it's, it's rice with additional genes from a corn and also a soil bacterium that allow the rice to develop beta carotene. And that, that development of beta carotene gives it that yellowish color, which, which is what's given it the name of golden rice. Now, beta carotene is very important because it's what allows the body to synthesize vitamin A. And vitamin A deficiency is linked to things like blindness or compromised immune systems. And a compromised immune system can lead to a lower life expectancy as well. So if we can make some modifications, now these are genetically modified organisms and therefore they generate the same sort of often negative publicity um, and um, controversy. Also, uh, people who uh, complain against it or maybe they might protest. Sometimes there's actually been destruction of the crops because of the violent nature of the way that people may feel about genetically modified organisms. And indeed, that, that is part of the history of the development of golden rice. But it is one example of where we might be able to apply genetic engineering to specifically target um, something like uh, this nutritional deficit. Now, as with genetic screening, the thing with genetic screening is that if you know that a particular um, disease is caused by a particular gene and you can identify that that gene is not present, then that's a very effective prevention mechanism. Likewise, if you can change some aspect of the diet that allows a particular vitamin or mineral that is deficient in the diet to actually be taken in as part of the normal diet just by some genetic modification. Again, this is very high efficiency in terms of um, prevention of the disease. We're not even treating this here. We're actually seeking to prevent it, stop it from developing in the first place. And so a third area where we might be able to apply our knowledge of genetic engineering is in this area of hormone and vaccine production. Medicine has a huge uh, input uh, into this whole area of research. And in fact, we've, um, uh, we've talked about insulin production before and the steps involved in uh, producing insulin for, for sufferers of diabetes. Now we do it very, very efficiently. We've even moved away from bacterial um, vectors to yeast vectors. And so um, that's a much more efficient way of being able to get the gene in to produce large amounts of um, insulin, which can then be uh, isolated and purified. Human growth hormone is also um, something that is produced in a similar sort of way, as are monoclonal antibodies, not antinodies. Uh, vaccines, too, can be um, the sorts of things that can be produced um, from mRNA or adenovirus vectors. So um, one thing that's very topical at the moment are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, as well as the AstraZeneca. 
And both of these are ones that are, are currently being pushed uh, as vaccines against the COVID virus, the COVID-19 uh, virus. The Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA. So basically we know that a messenger RNA is the little messenger that, that reads the code from the DNA that takes it to the ribosome where a protein will be made. So adding messenger RNA is basically specifically giving the information for the protein. And that protein is going to be those, those uh, COVID virus proteins that are going to stimulate a response. So this isn't something that's actually been incorporated into our DNA. It's actually something that's, that's specifically targeting the uh, ribosomes will produce through uh, bonding with the transfer RNA proteins that will stimulate that response from the immune system. AstraZeneca does the same sort of thing, except it doesn't do it with messenger RNA. It does it with an adenovirus, which is basically a viral vector. Think something like the common cold, which has just been um, attenuated or uh, destroyed so that it's not going to give you a full-blown cold. Um, so it's not as active as it would have otherwise been, but it is present. It can carry these um, pieces of RNA that are going to, again, work the same way the virus works, express that um, protein, um, the cell will produce the proteins, and then it'll stimulate the immune system to respond. So we've talked a lot about how these sorts of things operate in some of our other topics in uh, infectious disease and also in uh, genetic change in module six. So you see some of these ideas really starting to come together now and hopefully being able to feed one into the other. Gene therapies are something that are a very important part of medicine and are increasing in their use. And we've also talked about the technique of CRISPR, which is something else that you might want to um, think about right here. Uh, as a specific gene editing technique that we can get directly to exactly the parts uh, of the human genome that are carrying these uh, potentially faulty genes. I think what you're probably likely to do is use the same sort of criteria that we talked about previously to think about how each of these different techniques is involved in treatment and prevention of these specific types of diseases. So it's important that you've got a couple of examples that you can use when you're discussing these. But we'll have a, another look at those as we usually do during class. Thanks for watching.